thank you so much, Anne. That was um, fascinating. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that if you click that stop video button, which everybody's doing really good with, that'll keep this next segment in particular running smoothly for us because it takes a little bit of bandwidth. And um, as you've all been doing, go ahead and keep typing those questions into the chat window. Chris will be able to answer them as he's uh, showing you this video. He'll, he'll have a little bit of time there. And I gave it away. We've got Chris Yates up next. He's demonstrating how to make his trademark baffler puzzle. It's an absolutely action-packed pre-recorded presentation. I've gone ahead and seen it. And he's describing his art process from start to finish. He might be crazy for sharing his trademark secrets, um, or maybe just crazy enough. You be the judge on that. And as a reminder, just keep those questions coming. You ready, guys? All right, Deb, thanks so much for the uh, wonderful intro. I am Chris Yates, I make the Baffler puzzles. Um, and I've got a wonderful presentation for you. It is pre recorded for reasons that you will quickly ascertain. And we're just going to get uh, started with it. I, we've done our best to make this as uh, compressed and as nice looking as possible. Um, and so if there's a little bit of a lag, just be patient. It should be just fine. And by the way, you can always check it out on YouTube uh, a little later on our Puzzle Parley YouTube channel, which you may have heard about. Anyhow, let's start the show and here you guys go. How's it going? I'm Chris Yates. I make the baffler puzzles. I'm coming to you today from sunny Ocean City, New Jersey, and I'm going to show you how I make these puzzles. Now, my puzzles are a little different than your average hand cut wooden puzzle, as A, most of them are inlaid into a tray, and then B, instead of pasting an image to the board, I'm actually depicting uh, the image through the colors and the shapes of all the individual pieces. So now, let's make one. All right, here we are in my delightful wood shop, also known as the garage. And today's puzzle, we're going to make something fairly small and simple, so it won't take too long. Uh, it's a crab with a beach ball, which is, you know, pretty apropos for where we are on the Jersey Shore right now. And uh, the material you, you see here is MDF, medium density fiber board. I've already done the part of drawing the design onto the board and uh, sort of labeling what colors I want each section to be, as well as the base. And then I've roughed out the board. This is quarter inch, this is half inch. The half inch piece is a little bit bigger than the quarter inch because this is gonna comprise the base. All right, here we are on my saw. This is a DeWalt 788. Uh, I know a lot of you guys, if you're out there cutting puzzles, you may have seen these or used these on a regular basis. I highly recommend them. And uh, we've got a standard two slash O blade. Um, it's basically a hundredth of an inch thick. It's got 28 tiny little teeth on it, all facing down. And this allows me to get really super nice intricate cuts and uh, also keep the kerf, you know, the area you're taking away with the blade on, of the wood um, to be as small as possible so your puzzle fits back together nice and cleanly. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I cut at a relatively slow speed. Um, this allows me to have more control. And right now what we're doing is we're separating the base layer from the piece mass. Now you can see I'm more or less going along the lines that I've drawn out, but I'm actually a little cleaner with my saw blade than I am with a pencil. So I will sort of straighten out things and round things over as I go and make little modifications. Because another thing you want to think about when you're making puzzles is especially when you're making these sort of designs with all kinds of arms and legs sticking out every which way, you don't want to make things that are too skinny or fragile or too pointy because they're not going to really work very well as jigsaw puzzle pieces because you want these things to be durable and last.
So another thing you can see that I'm doing here is I'm pretty much keeping the, the piece moving at the same rate. And I'm not, you know, I am making some pretty quick pivots with my hands, but I'm trying not to make any super sudden moves. And this allows you to get a nice smooth cut rate and nice flowing lines. So you sort of start and stop a lot um, and, you know, turn the machine off mid cut. It's going to sort of ruin the rhythm of what you're doing and not give you as clean lines. And you may get little, um, you know, flaws like, uh, you know, the blades skipping around here and there. You generally don't want flaws in your puzzles. All right, the legs. This is the fun part. Get a little bit more exercise doing the legs. All right, so now we're getting close to being done with this cut. So this one is pretty easy to resolve. You can see that cut line that I made in the very beginning to get to the piece mass. I want to match up with where I started, with where I end. So you want to sort of think about where that, that corner is going to be and you want to try to hit that. You want to hit it and not go over. It's like the price is right. Okay, so we have our piece mass, which is the crab, and we have the base layer over here. Um, now this is a jeweler's file. It's a, I don't know, what's like a 600 or something like that. I got this years and years ago, I forget. There's going to be a little burr usually at the very end of your cuts. So what I do is just briefly do a little bit of that. You don't need to sand it. You just need to, you know, take off that little tiny burr that you're going to get at the end of the MDF. And that makes it look a little cleaner. So we still have one thing to cut out before we can say goodbye to our base layer for a little bit. And that is the beach ball. Okay, so we've got our base layer from the top level and then we've got our half inch piece here. And so this is gonna comprise the base. We're gonna glue this in a little bit, um, but for now we're just gonna say goodbye to the base, put it on the table over here. And here we have a cardboard box with a weight in it. Why do I have the cardboard box with a weight in it? These are a very useful way to manage your pieces. You don't want them just lying around on a table. You don't want them falling out of something. And if it's windy or you accidentally knock it, the weight keeps the pieces where you need them. So. We need to now divide these into the relative color groups. You can see our crab is marked space and space. That's like black with white dots. So you get sort of glossy black eyes for a crab. And then I thought it'd be fun to make a, a little bit of a gradient of red colors on the crab. So the, the uh, top part is a little bit lighter than the bottom part. And we put in a new blade. So we're ready to start cutting apart all our different color sections. First, we're gonna chop the eyeballs off. You can also see that I slow down a little bit near the very end of the cut, and that helps make it a little bit, a clean, little bit cleaner. I'm also using this file again at the end of every cut, so that sort of helps clean off the burr a little bit. Okay, so we are all set cutting apart the different color sections of Mr. Crab or Mrs. Crab. I haven't really assigned a gender and who needs to. Okay, we just gotta cut the beach ball. And okay, so this has got a little bit of an issue here. So these, this would be a possibly a, a sort of a pointy area if I resolve this the way I drew it. So I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna come in basically perpendicular to where the, the edge is. And then I will shift, so as I get in a little bit, then I'll shift around a little bit. You see what I did there? So this preserves the look that I want with this curve, but it, it helps make the edges a little cleaner and not as fragile as, as I'm talk, talking about. You don't want those little pointy bits, but you want it to look like a beach ball. All right, welcome to the painting zone. Here we have my super professional setup where I basically have more pieces of MDF on top of trash cans with weights. 
Um, this allows you to sort of change out tables and flip them over and um, move them back and forth. Um, works for me. So we've got our box of pieces over here and here are our basic colors we're going to be using. This is not the final paint job by any means. This is what we call color coding, where there's two basic things we're trying to do here. We're going to indicate which side of the piece is up. We're also going to indicate which section of the puzzle the pieces belong to. Now you could do this by just writing in pencil on top of every single piece you make, but that gets a little tedious, especially if you're making a big puzzle. Uh, I usually do wear this mask when I'm cutting and sanding, but I've been a little lax because I'm talking to you today and I've got lots of important things to tell you. But you do definitely want to wear this when you're spray painting. Um, it's, it's not a good idea to spray paint without a mask. Okay. You just need a little bit, just enough to indicate what color it is and what side is up. You don't want to goop this. See my shirt? No gooping. <laughs> All right, so these are our sort of light to dark red colors. I'm using a little bit of an orangey red at the top, and then I'm doing a little bit of an aubergine at the bottom part of this color gamut. Um, a color gamut, um, is, I'm going to reference this word a bunch, is basically, you know, a small range of colors or a broad range of colors. And a lot, with a lot of my work, I sort of move through color gamuts. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the final painting stage. So our eyeballs are going to be black. And then we've got our beach ball parts. You may be asking yourself, Chris, you're only using Rust-Oleum? Pretty much 99% of the paint I like to use is the Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover. You can get this at Home Depot. Um, it's, it's, it's great for what I do. It's got great consistency through all the different colors, satin, semi-gloss, gloss. gloss. Um, there's, you know, good, you know, 80 standard colors and you can find some other ones here and there. I do use Krylon occasionally because um, they've got some good shades, but it's a little, little thin. Valspar has terrible caps and you really don't want to use the graffiti paint um, like Montana and stuff like that because A, it's really expensive and B, it's really thick because it's made for, you know, for walls. And that's just going to make your pieces not fit back together. Now we're going to let these dry for a little while, uh, you know, just like 10 minutes or so. You don't want them to be too sticky and when you're uh, cutting them apart. So now we've got our top level and our bottom level. Oh, look at this. Oh my gosh. Burrs on the bottom. So we went and take our palm sander and clean these off real quick. And then I also just do a quick run with the palm sander on the top surface of the half inch layer. So here we have a Ryobi palm sander, not very fancy, but it's a palm sander. You know, you, you don't need to buy a super expensive palm sander. Oh, this one's fairly light. If you're holding a sander for an hour a day, like I often do, you don't want a really heavy sander either. Um, if you don't have a palm sander, you can just use sandpaper. It may not give you quite as clean a finish, but it'll still work. That's really all you need. I'm just, I don't want to take the finish off this wood. So I just wanted to clean it up in case there was a little bit of rough edges on there. And then with this guy, we're going to be a little bit more thorough, but we're also going to make sure we do not bevel this thing. We want to keep this palm sander perpendicular or, or basically flat on, on this here. And then we're going to want to turn it three or four times so that we get every little chunk of this because we don't want little hairs sticking out of our, uh, our sort of piece area. Okay, so now we get a nice look at We just look at it and we make sure it looks good. And it looks pretty good. Okay, so now I'm gonna blow the dust off. All right, welcome to the gluing station. Here we are. I'm gonna take off my wrist braces. Chris, why do you have wrist braces? I'm like, I'm a, I've been making puzzles for 17 years. You'd be wearing wrist braces too. Okay, so we're going to need a couple things here. We've got our wood glue. I like Type Bond too. Works great. Very reliable. We're going to want a paper towel. This is so you can wipe off, or a rag works as well. So you can wipe off. I use my finger to spread the glue. I don't really use any fancy tools for this. This is a pretty low-tech part of the operation. Um, and then you're going to want a phone or a clock in front of you so you can keep track of the time. Now this part... When I do workshops, this is a little tricky for people to understand. You do not want a lot of glue. You want enough glue to cover most of the area of the back of your base layer here. Um, 
but you don't want to you don't want to goop it on there because you're going to get glue coming into the area where the pieces are supposed to be. And this is something you really don't want for obvious reasons. Um, it happens to the best of us occasionally with things like this. We're going to have to try to put some glue in some tiny little areas. Uh, which you can also use a nail for or something like that if you want to get in there. Um, but basically, I'll show you how, how this works as I go. So I'm just going to run a pretty thin bead around this puzzle. A little bit of a tricky one. That's too much glue already. Now, I'm not even going to put any glue in that section. I'm just going to take some glue from somewhere else and just put a little dab of it in these little areas. Okay, so the other thing you gotta keep in mind is you do not want to get the glue too close to where the pieces are going. It's okay for the glue to go to the very edge because it's gonna get cut off. We're basically going to cut a common edge once this gets glued to the half inch piece. And you want to work pretty fast, but you want to do this carefully. You've only usually got a couple minutes before it starts to get a little tacky. Um, this does set up completely, in, well, it sets up to be able to work in 30 minutes. Its full strength is achieved in 24 hours, but generally a little bit after 30 minutes of putting your glue down, you can start cutting it again. Okay, so we've taken note of the time. It's 1243. All right, I'm gonna flip it over, uh, make sure there's no dust on there, and boom. So, 12.43, we wanna wait, we wanna be the human clamp for six minutes for this guy. Why don't you just let it be, or put it in the clamps now? Um, the glue is going to still be a little viscous at this beginning point. It's gonna, st it's gonna sort of tack up in this next six minutes or so. And so I want to basically make sure this thing doesn't skate around too much. I want to push down with pressure and push down the various areas where the glue is. Um, but I don't want this thing to be starting to skate left or right or any which way because then the glue will smear into your piece area. Uh, again, you don't want that to happen. Gluing, um, like many things in puzzle making, is sort of tedious, but it's a uh, necessary part of the procedure. So now we go over to our clamping jig. These are little devices that I've made in various sizes. So you can easily sandwich your puzzle base and then use clamps in the four corners, or sometimes more for the larger jigs, to easily keep your puzzle under pressure while the glue is finishing setting up. This I recommend doing as it'll give you a nice clean look and you won't get any gaps between your boards and it'll look like one nice solid piece, which is what you want. But meanwhile, we've got our pieces over here, which are pretty much dry and ready to be cut apart a little bit more. Now, obviously the beach ball and the crab eye balls do not need to be cut down any further into puzzle pieces as they are more or less puzzle piece size. Um, but, you know, obviously we're going to split these up a little bit and we're gonna to try to use some interesting joinery where possible. Joinery are all those sort of knobs and squiggly bits that the, make the uh, pieces fit together. Um, and I have a wide variety of them I like to use. It's gonna be a little tricky with some of these because they are pretty skinny little areas. Um, so I'm going to keep the joinery fairly simple. So, all right, we we'll back over here on our saw with our 2 blade. And first I'm just gonna, let's see, where am I gonna cut here? I'm gonna make a, a little flat. So that's what I call a flat piece of joinery. So we'll start out over here on this side with a round. Okay, let's do a little Y. If you look closely at my puzzles, you will see lots of little Y and C-shaped pieces of joinery. So let's do something fun here. Let's, uh, we're going to put in a little spiral. Oh, but we're going to make it a spiral with sort of a flat exterior. And then we're going to do a little, a little round thing sticking out. 
you know, have fun with it. You know, joinery, there's no real set hard and fast way to do joinery. Every cutter's got their own style. Some people use multiple styles. Um, I sort of usually have a kind of a kitchen sink approach where I sort of just play around and do all kinds of fun things on the fly. Um, you can obviously design your joinery ahead of time if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, but for the most part, what I do, after the color sections have been separated, I'm just sort of going to town and cutting how I feel. Now this is what I call an earlet. This is a pretty standard piece of puzzle joinery. So here's something I'm going to show you that's basically called bisecting female joinery. Sounds a little weird, but every cut's got a, a male part. You know, this would be the male part of, the, of that earlet. This is the female part of that earlet. Now to make your puzzle a little bit more difficult, you can cut this part in half, cut this into two different pieces. So I'm just going to do a little, little yeah, kind of like a bird beak kind of thing there. And you want to be careful with your joinery so you're not cutting things that are too fragile. And so now I've obscured that, that female part of the, uh, the earlet I cut before, makes it a little bit trickier for you to put that part of the puzzle together. So these are ways that you can sort of make the difficulty of your puzzle, you know, higher or lower depending on how you are cutting the pieces apart and in which ways. Another thing you can do is, if you use the same kind of joinery repeatedly, that'll make it more difficult as well because there's a lot of similar looking pieces. If you cut with a pretty, you know, wide variety of cuts, it makes it a little bit easier, but it also makes it a little bit more interesting. You know, this is kind of a weird spot to end up, but I think we can make these two pieces fairly consistent in size, which is another thing you more or less want to be trying to do in puzzle making is you don't want some pieces to be teeny tiny and some pieces to be enormous. All right, so we made a sort of little hammer shape there. Not exactly, but it's pretty close to my hammer. All right, and your piece cutting is complete for the crab. And are you guys ready for what happens next? This is so exciting. I told you guys it's gonna be fun. We're gonna be sanding the pieces. It's gonna be so much fun. I carefully hold the pieces in my other hand. Now again, this is where kind of long fingernails come in handy because it sort of protects your fingertips from getting sanded off. Um, this, is, this can be kind of tedious and a little bit uncomfortable, but it's a necessary step in what we're doing here. Um, so I'm using 220 grit sandpaper. You just wanna zap it for a couple seconds on each side. You know, you, you flip it over, you want to sand both the front and the back, um, but you don't want to take off too much material. You just want to take off any possible burrs. Okay, you guys ready? All right, so that's what you're looking for. I've taken off a little bit of that color code, um, but not enough. If you're taking off all the paint that you put down there, you're sanding too much. And then here's the back side. So it looks nice and clean. Compare that to an unsanded piece and you'll see why this is a necessary part of the process. So basically I'm going to be following this line and cutting it out on this guy. Okay, hello again. Um, so you can see I've completed my cut here of the crab. We're gonna knock some of the sawdust out by flipping it over. And we'll just sort of give it a little bit of an inspection. Looks pretty good. So that looks much better. Look at that. Nice clean edge. Nice clean back. All right, so we're ready to paint. All right, so the painting has begun. Um, I just put the primer on these pieces. Putting the primer on isn't that exciting, so I figure well, I'll show you more in detail when we actually put the second coat of paint on. We're doing three coats of paint. Three nice, even, light coats of paint on your pieces. We start with the primer and then we move on with the second and third coats to the colors. Here are our main colors we're using for the crab today. So basically this first table is the lightest part of the crab, sort of the, the claws on the top. It's going to be these three colors that I've sort of put into these little groups and I just blew off the sawdust drill, simple, and uh, you can also use an air compressor if you've got lots of pieces. They're kind of noisy but they do a great job of blowing sawdust off. And then the next table behind me is going to be the medium colors of the crab. And then the last one is going to be the darkest colors 
of the red spectrum. Why use primer? This is a question people ask because often these spray paint brands will say it's paint and primer or a lot of different kind of paint that does this. They always want you to just say, oh, we just go with the color and you're done. But in my experience, uh, the primer gives you a much more even finish. It gives you better color saturation than using the color by itself. Okay, so now it's time to paint the base. I like to paint the back of the base too because it would look kind of crappy if you just painted the front and then your customer turned it over and it's like, why didn't they paint the back? Uh, now I blew off those, those pieces just by going um, but I'm actually going to use my air compressor for this because you really don't want to have any dust in here and it's just a lot easier. So here's the sound of the air compressor. So we're going to try to do a sea to sky kind of thing here where the bottom is going to be a little bit more of this color with a little bit of a darker blue and then the sky is going to be sort of lighter blues, you know, to try to do a little bit of a fade. So again, I'm sort of going to dance around this. I don't want to spend it too long in any one place because you don't want the paint to build up unevenly. So this takes some practice. You just gotta, you know, always go with lighter coats than you think you need rather than gooping it on. Um, with the back, I just do one coat because generally you don't really look at it very often, um, but you do wanna, you know, make it look nice. So now that we've got our, uh, our sort of coat on the back there, I'm gonna show you how I do one of my signature effects, which is paint spattering. Um, so now this is basically when you're intentionally clogging the nozzle of the can, or the cap, by sort of pressing it down about halfway, and it'll start spitting out little drops of paint like this. See that? So this is basically how you can blend different colors together to get interesting mixes between them. And again, this is a way to sort of work around the fact that you've got a limited amount of colors from the spray paint manufacturer. So as I said, I'm gonna to try to do a little bit of a fade on this one. So I'm doing droplets, but I'm trying to do it mostly, this is the darker blue, so I'm doing mostly droplets at the bottom. There are certain colors of spray paint that you can find more uh, hues of than others, like blues or blues and greens for some reason, uh, nature maybe. What's, what's not to like about blue? It's great. So many great blues out there. All right, so I'm doing a little bit of this lighter stuff and trying to do a little bit more on the top than the bottom, but still make a little bit of a gradient effect. Okay, this is the very lightest blue, so I'm doing this mostly just on the tippy top. Yep, that's, that's enough. So, uh, you know, less is more. Don't go crazy. Okay, so second coat, we're done with our primer. Get rid of that. Um, and we start with these colors. So you'll sort of see it, my pattern here, how I mix the colors as we go down this chain of crab one, crab two, crab three. All right, so this is one of the colors that carries over to the next one. So you sort of have to keep track of this in your mind. Now you can see that I'm trying to do light, even coats. I want to, you know, get the top saturated. I want to get some on the edges, but not too much. You don't want to goop the paint on. So our crab part's done. Now we've just got these super easy sections. I'm just gonna do yellow, blue, white, and black on these guys. Our second coat of paint on the pieces is all set. So now we've gotta wait a little bit longer than we did with the primer coat for this to dry. This is going to depend a lot on your temperature and your humidity. Um, I would generally say somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes, uh, usually until you, 
put on the next coat. You wanna wait till it's pretty much dry to the touch. You know? So I've already put down the third and final coat on the pieces and I put a initial first coat on the base that's sitting over there. Um, you guys get the idea of how I apply the paint, but I'm gonna show you sort of the finishing touch, which is adding my signature paint spatter. I won't bore you with explaining exactly how I mix all these colors together, um, but suffice it to say, the main idea is to try to make a nice little variety of uh, blends of color within each of your color gamuts. All right, let's do this. So with some pieces I put a lot of one color and sometimes I put a little. This is all in the name of trying to make variety. Yeah, there we go. Let's make this nice and crabby here. All righty. You gotta, think, you gotta think like the what you're making. You're thinking crab, it's gonna look like a crab. So we don't need any more coral. And then we finish up with this apple red here. This is a nice color. Nice and crabby. Oh yeah, looks, looks good. Just adding a few little bits of paint spatter can really change it from a solid color to something that's got texture. So I think our crab pieces are nice and finished. All right, we're just gonna add just a little touch of this marigold. Whoop. Just enough to give it a little bit of, I don't need to go too crazy with it. Happy little dots, right? Like Bob Ross says, all right? Happy little dots. Just a little touch of it. Yeah, oh, well, that's fine. Oh, oh, a little bit more. Yeah. All right, look at that. There's my crab eyes. A little bit of white in there to make it look like they're sort of glossy and reflective. Kind of cool, huh? Um, all right, so our pieces are all done. You hear my seagull friends over there. They approve of the paint job. Um, so we want to wait until they're ready to pick up. Like another like 20 to 30 minutes. But again, just be patient. Wait till they're dry. But what I do is basically just pick them up by the sides. I don't stick my finger on the top of it. I pick them up by the sides when they are ready to be picked up. Again, you can test this by just sort of tapping on areas of the table where you painted and seeing if the paint's dry enough. And then I take a piece of cardboard and put the pieces carefully on the cardboard, bring them inside, let them dry for a couple days, and then you put them back together. All right, so here we are over on the side of the lawn where we're painting the base. And uh, the first coat feels nice and dry. You can see I just did a nice light solid coat of this Oasis Blue. Now I'm gonna put another nice light even coat of Oasis Blue on it and then add all our spatter colors just like we did on the other side. pretty good. Gives a little bit of lightness at the top, a little bit of darkness at the bottom. Looks like the crab's having a nice day at the beach. And again, when this is dry, in like something like 20, 30 minutes, um, you can pick it up gently by the sides, bring it inside somewhere that's not dusty, somewhere that's not too hot or cold. Uh, I like to put, since this has got paint on the back of it, I usually like to put some bottle caps, some clean bottle caps in a little sort of landing pad configuration. You can put your puzzle on top of the bottle caps and that way most of the painted surface on the back isn't actually touching whatever table or shelf that you're storing it on. I'll see you guys in about two days, which we're magically gonna jump to in like the next 10 seconds. And two days later, our crab is all done and dry. Look at that. Here's our nice base here, painted on both sides. Nice and smooth, dry to the touch. And here's our 20 or so pieces. Um, so basically, now the puzzle is ready to be assembled. Um, the one thing I do wanna note that I do here is, since we are painting our pieces, um, 
Occasionally you'll get little paint crumbs that sort of form around the edges on the bottom of these things. So when I'm putting these together, I usually just have a little piece of cardboard, uh, corrugated cardboard, and I just do what I call squishy scratchy. So I'm basically just rubbing the bottom of this on the cardboard and that'll sort of dislodge any possible paint crumbs. Now, usually I try to be as clean as possible, but you never know. So that's what it looks like pretty good, right? You can even blow it off if you want. Um, but I've already done this for all the pieces because I didn't want to bore you guys too much. So let's put it together. crab this crab is having the time of their life I, I tell you so that's it basically um that's how i make one of these puzzles and you may be thinking to yourself chris this seems like a lot of work just to make one little crab puzzle well yes and no um generally if i'm making something like this i will probably make four or five similar puzzles to it they don't all necessarily have to be crabs but they will often share similar colors I'll often draw them all at the same time, so I'll paint them at the same time, sand them at the same time. So if you sort of gang them up like that, it's a much more efficient use of your time. But on the other hand, you know, anything worth doing, you know, takes some time, takes some work, takes some effort. And so I'm happy to put, you know, a lot of energy and time and into making what I do as, as cool as possible, you know, because it's a jigsaw puzzle. We're supposed to have fun with it, you know? Um, I think of it as art you can play with. So, you know, it's a real fun, you know, medium to work in because you're working with, you know, making something that's aesthetically pleasing and interesting as an art object, but it's also something that you can take apart and have fun with it and enjoy it with your friends and your family. So I'd like to thank everybody for watching this. Hopefully you've possibly learned something. Um, and uh, I'd really like to thank my cameraman, Ed. He's done a great job. And I'll see you guys next time. Hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen here once I submit my little poll question because I loved my I love my presentation. It was great. Um, not that I'm pressuring you guys to love it too. Um, Deb, did we have any? I, I know I was answering some questions in the chat uh, while did. we were watching that. There um, was but... one. Um, somebody, Dan, wanted to know if your process that you use means that all your puzzles, are they one of a kind? Uh, yeah, pretty much by the nature of how I make these, even if I was, I often will use the same design. Like sometimes I will make like five crabs or seven cats or, you know, um, 10 puzzles for the puzzle exchange or something. And they're all a little different, but they're using the same template just because of the nature of how I make things. I don't really, um, for the most part, really plan out my individual piece cuts. Um, so that's often the most, um, you know, unique part of uh, what I'm doing is uh, just the fact that it's all handmade. And I do collaborate with uh, people who make uh, cardboard and laser cut puzzles too. So uh, mm -hmm. not everything is 100% handmade, but I'm also trying to get things out there at different price points. Okay. Um, some more questions are coming in. This is kind of a fun one. Somebody asked, what are the many pieces behind your shoulder? Um, in the, your workshop? Oh, yeah. So when I was upstairs there, um, that's all been broken down now because I'm actually moving to Montana in six days. Um, so what you saw was sort of the last iteration of my, uh, my studio here in Ocean City, New Jersey. Um, and yeah, so I basically have like one of those little like desk, you know, file organizers that you would have in an office. And I just cut pieces of cardboard that are exactly the same size or a little smaller than each of the trays and the little desk organizer. And so when you go out and you pick up your pieces, when you're, you saw me out there with all this, you know, these pieces um, being painted, um, the last boring step after they're dry, at least dry to the touch, is you wanna go out there with a piece of cardboard or some sort of tray um, and pick up the pieces. And then eventually you wanna take the pieces off said tray 
um, onto like I have a little octagon. You you, you saw the wooden octagon that's a lazy Susan that I use for the most part. Um, so yeah, you got to organize your pieces. You got to know where they are. You got to have messy spots for them. You got to have clean spots for them. Yeah. Um, somebody wanted to know, uh, could you repeat what kind of saw you use? And um, they're also interested in uh, what, when you say you cut at a fairly slow speed, do you have a number for that? Sure. Um, so I'm using a DeWalt 788. This is actually my fifth one. Um, I, I think they're great machines, but I tend to, you know, bust them after about three years because I've made about, I've made close to 4,700 puzzles or close to 4,800 now. Um, so they last me about three years, um, but I usually get a good, you know, six or 700 puzzles out of them. Uh, price points about 450 usually at Home Depot or some other woodworking stores. Um, as far as the speed I use, I usually have somewhere between three and four. Um, okay. it's, it goes up to, I think it goes up to eight or nine. I don't know why it goes up to 10, but you know, it should go up to 11. That would be cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think you've answered most of the other questions um, throughout the chat. Somebody had asked about you using water-based paints. Yeah, know? I wrote I wrote down a, a note about that because um, I, I forget exactly who asked me about that. But uh, feel free to email me or something about that because I've I've tried some weird spray paints back when I lived in Boulder, Colorado. Like there was like natural-based spray paint, and um, it would cost like twenty-five dollars a can and didn't work. Um, but, you know, um, I'm always curious. Uh, one thing about MDF is it's, especially before it's sealed with paint and primer, it doesn't like water. Um, so that's, what, you know, it's because it will swell up and it basically makes your puzzle unusable. So I generally pe tell people the rules of my puzzles are like the gremlins or like the mogwais in the movie gremlins, like uh, don't put it in direct sunlight, don't get it wet and don't feed it after midnight. <laughs> I like that. Well, we're coming up uh, close to 244 here, which is when we have to move on with the presentation. Um, but as you said, people can contact you how? I'm at chrisyates.net. Um, and you can find all my contact information there. If you want to email me directly, superyates at gmail.com. And you can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at superyates. And Deb, thanks for helping me with the intro and the questions.